Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, November 16th, 2017, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank everybody for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I am humbled by your presence, so thank you so much. So what do we talk about? Well, obviously, we talk about current market conditions, your questions on trading, your favorite stock picks. If you don't mind, and this is for your benefit, wait until we get to the actual chart. So I'll see your questions, and then you'll get buried on your stock picks. And the other thing is just ask about one symbol at a time and hit return. You can ask about as many as you want, and I'll stay here and answer as many as possible. But to make sure, again, for your benefit, that we get to as many as possible, just ask about one at a time and then hit enter. So what do we talk about? Well, I'm going to do another Bitcoin update. And I'm not going to obsess over Bitcoin or anything, but there's a few things that I did discover and experience over the week that I want to share with you. And then the main focus is going to be what's more important, your attitude or aptitude. And I put revisited on this because I did a piece back in February, which I'll likely update and uh, republished on Friday. So keep an eye out for that. And then the other thing I want to talk a little bit about is the Phoenix strategy. It's it's something that I've talked about throughout the years, and I figured now would be a good time to show you a couple examples of that and how they factor in. Before we do all that, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, or as often sum it up, all predictions about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. All right, I want to do a quick Bitcoin update on my experiences over the last week. And as I said last week, tread lightly, okay? Caveat mTOR, just remember. And... Just my experiences from last week show that it's still the wild, wild west. The exchanges, and I use that term loosely last week, seem to be questionable. When the market heats up like it is now, you seem to have trouble getting to the website. So it's like right when you need it at its worst, right when you need it the worst, their websites begin going down. And this is what I received from another service that I have, another trading service is a partially degraded service. I'm not sure what that means, but that seems to have been up for like the last week or so. I've noticed some of the fees when you're trying to, before you actually, the trading fees, or, trading fees aren't cheap from what I can tell so far. They're pretty high, but the um, fees to actually buy the Bitcoin or any other crypto are pretty ridiculous. It's almost, um, it's almost scam worthy. And evidently, they must be seen as dubious. I had a voicemail that my bank wanted me to call them to question some of the transactions. And last night, I was uh, picking up some books, and I tried to use my debit card, which had plenty of money in the account, for my purchase at least, and it wouldn't go through. And the reason was, I think my bank shut down my account because they – or exercising a little paternalism on my behalf, thinking that somebody must have hacked my account to buy Bitcoins. Now, the good news is technical analysis is alive and well. Last week, I got stopped out of a long position around 6,000 or so. And then I looked at the chart and said, you know what? That sure looks like a pullback in a nice, fairly persistent and accelerating uptrend. And what do we do with pullbacks in persistent and accelerating uptrends? Well, we trade them. So I got back in around 6,500 or so, and so far, so good. Now, I'm not gonna report to you every Bitcoin trade that I make. I just wanted to show a few things such as technical analysis still works, the exchanges are a little dubious, and buyer beware, obviously. Now, just in case Phil is here, before he can point out this, I 
eyeball the chart, and by eyeballing a chart, I recognize that Bitcoin had probably pulled back to the 50-day moving average, and lo and behold, it did. Phil's a big, big fan of the 50-day moving average. He likes to trade pullbacks around there. And the other thing, too, is notice we have this nice, nice daylight here, and then the price kisses the moving average. In, I think it was Lehman's, I wrote about daylight, daylight pullbacks. And basically, you're just looking for so many days. I think it was 20 days above the moving average. In the book, I use a 20-day EMA. And then, I think that's what it was, and then a pullback to it. Similar to Linda Rasky's Holy Grail, except that I am looking for the daylight, and that's my indicator, so to speak. Whereas I think she was using ADX or something like that. All right, a couple of random thoughts just left over from last week. I think the blockchain is going to be much bigger than the Bitcoin in and of itself, but that's what makes the Bitcoin work. And again, using use technical analysis. I do think that it's going to become more and more efficient, as I said last week or week before, with contracts on real exchanges, such as the CME being traded on it, or was it CBOT? I forget which one, one of those Chicago exchanges. It's going to become more and more efficient. And by efficient, I mean it's going to tend to get a little choppier because you're going to have people, more and more participants, beginning to fight it out. And nobody believes. Phil says, I am not trading Bitcoin, no faith in it, but agree blockchain will be value remaining. Uh, I think the cryptocurrencies are here to stay, but it's going to be a bumpy ride. Uh, I would do it on a very small scale. Uh, as I said, I think last week, I got pretty nervous when I finally did get into one of my exchanges and I had zero value of my account. So that did make me a little nervous for a while. But I just chalked it up to the fact that maybe the website's down and it's, it can't see what I actually have there. Um, I think it was John McAvee I was talking about last week. Hackers are really working hard to disrupt the system. The, the, the cryptography, if that's the correct word, of the blockchain, the way I look at it, is pretty solid. And the capitalism involved to keep that blockchain in place is just amazing. And if you go back and watch prior week of charts, I did a, or you could just do it on your own, do a Google search on Bitcoin forms uh, for images, and you'll be amazed at the amount of money that's being thrown at that. So capitalism is at its best. But the hackers are going crazy with this, and they're really working hard to disrupt the system. And I think what uh, McAvee was talking about was the your cell phone. If your cell phone gets a virus, it could take a picture of what's on your cell phone, and that's where a hacker could go in and steal your Bitcoins if you're keeping them on your cell phones. An example used was some of these wealthy people in California are running around with 100K worth of Ethereum or Bitcoin or whatever in their phones and bragging about it. It's like, well, if a hacker got into that, there's nothing that that person can do. Once you begin to wrap your head around the technology, the blockchain and such, it can't be easily unwound. And as McAfee himself pointed out, mistakes or carelessness will cost you. So again, tread lightly, okay? Now, one, the other thing that I saw that I didn't even think about that McAfee said was inflation in Bitcoin means deflation in fiat currencies. So that makes sense. If one's going up, then obviously one is going down. Yeah, Phil, I agree with you, but I think it's so big right now that it, it's uh, – Phil says, my electrician knows I trade. He asked me about his, about his brother-in-law trading it and wanted advice, the shoeshine boy in modern era. The shoeshine theory or shoeshine uh, – easy for me to say. The uh, story of the shoeshine boys is back in, back in the day, back in the 20s or 30s, early, late 20s or whatever, when the shoe shine, the boy who shines your shoes starts giving you stock tips or talking about stocks, then you know that a bubble is in the works. So is it a bubble? Absolutely. But bubbles could go a lot further and last a lot longer than people are 
willing to believe. And I think there's a lot of people that haven't come into the markets. Now, technically, and I know, who knows, it's a wild, wild west, but technically there's only 22 Bitcoins, 22 million Bitcoins, that is, that are out there to be mined by, I forget what year it is, 2040 or something like that. So if all that stays together, and that's a big if, there's only so much to go around. Guy says, shoeshine now compared to taxi driver stock tips. Yes, yes, yes. I had a, um, I had an Uber driver that traded options a while back. It was kind of interesting when I was on one of my trips. Oh, you can it, you could get it in MetaTrader. Okay, email me on that. I trade Bitcoin. Oh, you're doing CFDs. Okay, on Avatrade. We can't do CFDs here in the states. I met some guys years ago that were um, they had an office in Chicago, and I think they were just in there playing ping pong, sitting around, and they were trying to get CFDs approved over here. And the day that that they got approved over here, they were gonna make a fortune. But I don't think I don't think CFDs have uh, are coming to the states anytime soon. Yeah, you're betting on a spread, and that's that's t that's tough. I, I heard that uh, the uh, English government doesn't even charge you taxes on CFDs because most people lose money on it. It's not even worth their accounting. But, yeah, I think that the, the smart trader can probably trade CFDs and make money off of it. CFDs, for those of you who don't know, are, are – what's it stand for? Contracts for difference? It's a spread type of thing where you're betting on a spread. Spread betting, right? So yeah, it's it's certainly a bubble, and it's certainly something that's buyer beware and be careful. Um, as I said in previous uh, webinars, your when your money is on an exchange, it's not protected by SIPC. I would, you know, I'm anti-regulation, but I'd love to see a little regulation come in. And the problem is they can't. They can't unwind trades. So to my knowledge, I don't know how you could unwind a trade. So those Ethereum trades, when it went from 300 bucks to 10 cents, those 10 cent trades could not be unwound. Now, the only way that the people were made whole was that the exchange stepped up and took money out of their pocket, as I said last week. So it's definitely, it's definitely the wild, wild west, and it's definitely pretty crazy. So... So do tread lightly. Don't complain to me when you lose a bunch of money, but I think you could you could dabble in it and do it in small amounts and use technical analysis to become part of this thing or bubble, so to speak. Now, I, I love bubbles. Bubbles are great. I, give me another 1999 and hopefully it lasts a little bit longer than that one does. And you could make a lot of money riding a bubble up and then you could you could short on the way down, too. So, okay, MK says CFDs are a scam. Okay. Yeah, you know, I don't know enough about CFDs, but I know that it's a type of trading where it's kind of tough to get it right, and that's why you have a lot of trouble with, uh, with CFDs making money, and that's why they don't even care. Yeah, Bitcoin, 74.21 right now. Bits are only good to be used with bytes. I don't know. I disagree. I think uh, I think it's here to stay, but it's going to be. I want to get in front of it. I, you know, it's like a. I've been meaning to do something on it for a long, long time, and then it just kind of. I went from four thousand to eight thousand before I even began to start talking about it. All right, what's more important, your your attitude or your aptitude? When I did the trading full circle course, I did two things when I got started during this course. I said, okay, if I could go back in time and talk to that young punk version of me, what would I tell him? And the other thing I thought was just the opposite, and this is how I came up with the name trading full circle, but just the opposite was – what would someone who is much more seasoned possibly have lost sight of? We all 
tend to, before we know it, make things a little bit more complex than we need to, or maybe we over leverage when we shouldn't, or over trade when we shouldn't, or not honor our stop. And all of these problems are easily, and I'm kind of using that term easily, loosely, but they, if you think about it, if you boil it all down, they can be fixed quite simply by honoring your stop and following the plan and keeping it simple and so on. So in a nutshell, I would tell myself, stop chasing holy grails. Spend most of your time working on your attitude towards the markets. And you're going to need a little money management. So if I could go back and talk to that young punk version of me, I'd say don't focus so much on trying to figure out the exacts of the market, but figure out yourself. And this is what I'd say. It's going to be a lot harder than it looks. The elbow is near, but try to bite it, Russian proverb. I bought a book on Russian Proverbs the other day. The, I say the other day. It's probably two years ago. <laughs> and uh, I find it quite interesting. Every now and then I'll look through it, some very interesting things. But this was one that really uh, caught my attention. And, of, of course, I tried to bite my elbow soon thereafter. I don't know how many of you right now are trying to bite your, your elbow. But it's not the easiest thing in the world. But when you look at the charts, and let's say if you're a pullback player like me, you just have to recognize a pullback and buy it. And then, of course, put in a stop at an appropriate amount away to survive that short-term volatility. And then hopefully be able to take partial profits and then trail a stop. And that's pretty much it. But it's a lot harder that it appears on the surface. As I often say, the markets will often fake you out and shake you out. And a lot of times they'll do the obvious in an unobvious manner. And they'll also do whatever it takes to cause the most pain to the most amount of the participants. Now, by the most obvious and an unobvious manner, and I'm borrowing these florisms from Linda Raskin, I asked her where she got them. And because I thought they were her quotes and she's like, no, nah, I just probably picked them up on the floor. And um, I love Linda. She's great. She, she's very modest and, and, and doesn't take much credit for a lot of these things that, that she may even come up with, uh, have came up with. But anyway. But she said these are probably florisms. Now, if you think about the most obvious and unobvious manner, that's let's say you have a market that's. Looks like it's obviously going straight up, okay? Well, if you think, well, I'm just going to jump on, what will happen? It'll have a big knockout move and shake people out. And it'll also make the shorts think that, oh, wait a minute, this market is topped. I better pile on. And then what does it do? It does the most obvious thing, goes right back up. And that, from a psychological standpoint, puts pressure on the shorts, squeezes them out, and it also forces people back into the market who may have gotten shaken out. Margin call. Don't answer it. Now, Covell once equated trend following to riding the bouncing Bronco. And I think I have an older version of his book here that doesn't have the Bronco, but I notice a newer version does. And if you think about it, you get on a trend and you're like, all right, this is great. This trend following is wonderful. I, I get it, Big Dave. I, I, I know why you like this trend following. You just sit back and relax and watch your money grow day after day after day. Well, settle down, Beavis. It's not quite that easy as anybody who's traded for more than a day knows. And in trend following, especially once you get into long-term trend following, it's going to look a lot like this. And the problem is you never know when this is going to become this. But it comes with the territory. And if you take a look at like Kemet, what we got stocked out of uh, recently, 
K-E-M. How many times do I have to tell you? <laughs> Investment center. I wonder what that is. <laughs> Why don't you just turn your phone off? Well, if I did, it would stay off for about six months. I'm also waiting on some very important phone calls, so I can't. But anyway, when you're trend following, especially, the market will work really hard to shake you out of the trend. And you have to be willing to give up some profits in the end. And as I often say, all trades eventually end badly. Now, I would also tell that younger, thinner, punk version of me, it's not going to be nearly as hard as you try to make it. Now that sounds like a bit of a contradiction. But it really isn't. Because as Curtis Faith once said, it takes a lot of time and study before one realizes just how simple trading is. But it takes years of failure before before most traders come to grips with how hard it could be to keep things simple and not lose sight of the basics. And at the last minute, I added this slide back, or I added this slide to the Trading Full Circle course because it sort of summarizes my whole feeling in this course. Let's get back to the basics and let's figure out how to make money with the basics. And then if we want to add in some more complex things or outsmart the market a little bit, then we can gradually kind of noodle with that, but we can't lose sight of the basics. So whenever you find yourself plotting that 15th oscillator, a derivative of a derivative of a derivative of a derivative, which, you know, some of my early, I look at some of my early indicators that I made, and I had like three times derivatives, I don't know what you would call that, a der literally a derivative of a derivative of a derivative. And I just thought that that was probably the way to go. And then, yes, I would plot 15, 15 oscillators on a chart. And then you have to be careful of it. I've, I actually, Greg Morris has pointed this out before. There are certain oscillators that are inverses of each other. And you either have to use one or the other. And sometimes they'll show charts with both of those oscillators on a chart. So you're going to always have these two diametrically opposed signals. So the point is, before I digress too far, I know too late. Keep it simple. And you can't lose sight of the fact that, first of all, the only way to ever make money on a, on a trade is to catch a trend. So all you have to do is catch a trend. And if, you, if that's on the buy side, you obviously have to sell higher than you buy. And the price does not lie. So don't overcomplicate it. Now, unless you're Bubba Clinton, what is, is. You have to ask yourself, is the market going up? Is the market going down? And of course, this is the toughest one for many people. Many people forget that sometimes the market goes sideways. Now, you guys are getting smarter and smarter in here, so it doesn't, my point doesn't make as much sense as it used to, but in the Trading Full Circle course, I said, if you don't believe me that people don't believe the markets go sideways, come to the next week of charts and look at how many stocks people ask about that have gone absolutely nowhere for weeks, sometimes even months or longer. Now, if you do the trade trading, that's fine, but if you've been trend trading for a while, then obviously a market that's going sideways is not in the trend. There's no holy grail. I used to spend hours and hours and hours and hours and hours searching for the holy grail. Every now and then, I'll still noodle around with some things, okay? But my biggest epiphany, it was kind of bittersweet. It's like the day I realized there wasn't a holy grail was probably the day I got serious and more consistent. And I remember, I've told the story a thousand times, but... I used to program these systems really early in the morning and really late at night. And, and usually I'd come up with a system, sometimes more or combinations of systems 
dozens of them maybe in a day. And I'd find one, run and tell my wife how great it was. And, you know, one day she's like, how many systems do you really need? It's like, you know what, Dave? You're right. You just need one. The one you're going to follow. Now, along those lines, you have to realize that the map is not the territory. So a, a lot of these systems, I think it was 20-something hundred last time I counted them. I no longer have them. I think I, I actually gave them to somebody in Italy uh, to, to noodle with. And I don't think he found a whole lot, so I'm not bragging. But let's say you do discover something great. And I've discovered some pretty amazing things back in the day when I was doing a lot of mechanical testing. Well, the map is not the territory. So if you've discovered something that looks like a holy grail, well, congratulations. You have just perfectly curved fit your system to the past market. And the future is going to be totally different. And I've gotten a bit of a heated debate once with someone. They got mad at me because I said your biggest drawdown is always in front of you with a mechanical system because you don't know what the future will bring. And they got very angry with me. I have a feeling they're no longer trading mechanical systems and probably doing something else. Now, here's one thing that, that took me a long time and I had a very painful experience with, and this is a two drink minimum, but even if something continues to work on paper, the map is not always the territory. And I had some very up close and personal experience with a system that worked really well for a long, long time. And it actually continued to work, but unfortunately, something that was very unforeseen, the margins got raised, so the positions had to be shut down prematurely, and it ended very badly. But had those had the margins not been raised, it would have continued to have worked as it had worked for the last 20 years. And that's the thing that I try to explain to people is some of these things will work until they don't. And the map is not the territory. The world's a lot more complex than it looks. But keep it simple. Don't over leverage. Use stops. Take partial profits. And then work hard to ride out that trend as long as possible. And you'll do just fine. Now, it's kind of interesting. I Whenever I, I talk about curve fitting and inflated claims or whatever, I usually always get an interesting email just uh just by chance and one of them was turn you could have turned 10,000 into 4.5 million well there was a little tiny asterisk because at first i'm thinking well why am i working so hard if i could turn 10,000 to 4.5 million rinse and repeat i mean i love you guys and girls don't get me wrong and i'm having a blast doing this but i don't know i I would it'd be a toss up, you know, do I do I go sailing or do I sit here and talk to you? It's like, I don't know. You, you might not see my fat ass again, but that's not the reality. So let's not talk in hypotheticals. And, you know, what would the world be without hypothetical questions? Right. But anyway, the, the fine print on this was that it was hypothetical. So they basically curve fit a system to the past market and they're touting it as turning 10,000 to 4.5 million. Well, anyone can write that system, okay? Um, you know, you could, you could figure that out pretty easy, but will it continue to work? Probably not. It certainly suggests some serious curve fitting. This one was a big one for me, and this took a while. I always felt like somebody else knew a lot more about the markets than me, and somebody knew exactly where they were headed. And this took me a long, long time to figure it out. And if you look at some more recent examples, such as such as the, um, and I hate to pick on um, poor Bill Ackman, but you look at him losing $4.5 billion in one stock, and he's one of the biggest hedge fund guys out there. You would think if anyone had an inside edge, he would, right? But he lost four and a half billion dollars. So no one knows exactly what a market will do. Now, this is really liberating because this means that the small private trader can compete with the big boys, okay? Um, 
I occasionally have RRAs email me and say, hey, Dave, I like that little small cap stock you recommended. It was nice job on that or nice job on that small IPO. It really took off. I'm impressed. But unfortunately, I couldn't trade it for my clients. So that's kind of proof positive that a big hedge fund can't come in and make money on a little IPO or a small cap stock. So in some cases, as a small private trader, you actually do have an advantage. I mean, you're not going to set up. I was just in a, uh, I was in an interview this morning with Benzinga, and it's like, well, you're not going to. They've talked. They mentioned with high frequency trading and all these other things that are happening. How are you going to compete as a small trader? It's like, well, you obviously can't set up a high frequency trading computers in your house. Because you're not close enough to the exchange, plus you would need a ridiculous amount of money to do that. It'd be very capital, capital intensive. But you can still follow the trend. And again, in some cases, you could use that, that being small and nimble to your advantage. So the pressure is really off when it comes to that. Now, you have to realize that the market is made up of a bunch of emotional beings. And you are one of those beings. So the way I wrap my head around this trading psychology is to be cognizant of my feelings throughout the day. When I'm dropping F-bombs, if I get a little excited when a position goes my way, if I get bored and feel like I want to fire off a trade, or any other bad behaviors or emotional responses, I think to myself, self, is it just me or would anybody else be possibly doing these things? And if you think about it, if you boil down technical analysis, it's just reading the psychology of the market while at the same time controlling or embracing, I should say, not controlling, because you can't control yourself from a psychological perspective. That's another conversation altogether, but you can embrace yourself from a psychological perspective. Now, I would tell that old self of mine to give yourself time to wait for opportunities. And that's hard because there's a trader's paradox. The easiest way to avoid losing any money is to not put any at risk. Yet the only way to make money is to put capital in the harm's way. So that's the paradox. And from a psychological standpoint, as I often preach, the trading world and the real world are often diametrically opposed. In the real world, you better do something. You better repair some transmissions or save some patients or whatever you do, build some buildings. You're not going to get paid to sit on your butt. But in trading, that's often the thing to do. Now, getting back to keeping it simple, less is more. Find something simple and stick with it. And wait until you have an opportunity to trade. Don't trade because you're bored. Don't trade because you're under pressure to trade. Wait until all of the pieces fit or as many of the pieces fit as possible. You know, years ago, I used to call it the meatloaf trade. I'm not a big fan of meatloaf, the, uh, the artist, although I will eat some meatloaf or anything else for that matter. <laughs> Pretty much anything else. But he had a song, Two Out of Three Ain't Bad, and I call that the meatloaf trade. you got to set up your like. In the overall market's not doing so hot, but the sector's doing pretty good. Well, two out of three ain't bad. And sometimes you'll have a setup like the DNRA, that we're going to talk about in a few minutes, where the sector wasn't doing so great, the market was doing okay, but the setup in and of itself looked pretty good. Sometimes you might just have one out of three. But ideally you want as many pieces to fit as possible. So you want to wait for that so-called fat pitch. Now, I'm not a big sports fan, but I know that 
from doing a little Googling, a fat pitch is a very hittable ball, and you have to swing at it. You might miss it, but you have to swing. And, and in baseball terms, the reason I call it fat pitch, it looks like a cabbage ball coming at you, or even bigger, like a beach ball is, is one of the guys refers to it. And that comes, obviously, with years of training. And even though you might miss, you have to swing at the fat pitch. Now, along the lines of keeping it simple and waiting for your opportunities, you always get something good out of living more. I let the craving for excitement get the better of my judgment. The desire for constant action, irrespective of underlying conditions, is responsible for many losses. In Wall Street, even among professionals who feel that they must take home some money every day as though they were working for regular wages. So you can't let the excitement get to you. I think I, like many people, was drawn to this business, especially when I got into it when I was a young punk, for the excitement. But the reality is it's actually pretty damn boring if done properly. Now, you always get something good out of Livermore. And a corollary to this or something to help you wrap your head around and make you feel comfortable while you're waiting for those opportunities is remember this. When you are doing nothing, those speculators who feel that they must trade day in and day out are laying the foundation for your next venture. You will reap the benefits from their mistakes. In a few minutes, I'm going to talk about the Phoenix setup or strategy. It's not a setup. It's a strategy. Just We might use a pullback or a bow tie or a first thrust. But as a general statement, it's a strategy. Well, you're not buying that market as it's hitting new lows. You're letting other people do that and build that base for you. Now, getting back to keeping it simple, Curtis Face said, the great irony of trading is that it is difficult precisely because it is so simple. And that's another one of those paradox type of things. So again, keep it simple. As I often say, if you can't put a trading system on a cocktail napkin, then toss it out because it's going to be much harder to follow a more complex system than a simpler one. And even with a simple system, you will make mistakes on occasion, no matter what level you're at. As I often say, and I would never throw anybody under the bus, but sometimes I'll be sitting in an actual presentation and they'll often have a chart up that looks like the one on the left where there's these multiple buy and sell signals, maybe a hundred of them or so. And they're talking about the merits of their system. In and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. I don't like the rat getting his cocaine, you know, banging on a little bar. Well, usually they always have a moving average plotted by default. And again, I would never call anybody out, but I, I often can't help but notice that instead of all that in and out, just following a simple moving average, Possibly something as simple as daylight, again, meaning the lows are greater than the moving average. I have an article on my website currently on this, I think. If not, go to more commentary. Would have kept you out a lot of trouble, and you would have made a lot fewer trades. And then one thing that's not advertised in the system on the left is that something bad can still happen shorter term. So if you're in and out, in and out, in and out, thinking that you're being nimble and quick, then you come in overnight and you're down, stock drops by whatever, 20 points overnight. Then all those little gains plus a lot more get wiped out. Whereas if you're riding a trend for a long time and you get whacked, it's going to suck. But at least you either broke even or maybe even made a little money on a trade. Every now and then you'll get whacked and lose some money. But at least you have the potential for our limited gains so you can compensate for the, that potential of the big loss on occasion. Now, 
obviously the battle is often from within. I've written a few times about helping kids, two to be exact, win stock contests or certainly do very well, enough to get an A in the course and move on. And I'm not bragging because they did so well, because they had the Grand Pumba helping them. The lesson here, the teachable moment here, is that they did exactly what I told them to do. They didn't think about their mortgage payment or their kid's college, that payment that was tuition that's due, or anything else. They simply wanted to get an A and move on, so they followed the plan that I gave them. And usually, well, it's only been twice, but if someone were to attempt this, I just say you can only you can only buy new highs, and when forced to trade, because a lot of these classes make them trade, you have to sell either losing positions, and if you don't have any losing positions, you have to sell your smallest gainer. And that forces you to stick with winners and get rid of losing positions. Now, speaking of losing positions, you're going to be wrong a lot. And that's hard to be wrong. I like being right. I It's one thing that I'm working on with this big psychology course I'm working on. Um, I'm thinking about releasing a micro uh, course from the, from the trading full circle. And I'll probably have that up within a week or two. But in the big course I'm working on, one of the books I read talked about personality tests. I took a personality test, and I scored, like, super low in agreeableness and maybe even a zero in, in one of the factors, actually, you know, which was, like, kind of shocking and, and very eye-opening. And I'm going to talk a lot about that in the course, about the importance of taking a personality test just to get to know yourself a little better. But the fact that I scored so low on agreeableness means that I expect the market and other people, whoever, to agree with me. That means that I think I'm right. And then I think I scored through the roof on uh, on ego, or I forget what they call it, but it's something ego related. So not only do I expect the market to agree with me, I have a huge ego. And... Uh, Extroversion, I think, is what it is. I scored like off the charts in extroversion. Well, I guess that's why I'm here doing a presentation today because because I'm a bit of a ham. I like getting out there. I like traveling the world. I like getting in front of people. For me, it's a rush. It's fun. But those things don't necessarily work too well in the market. Being Having a big ego and being low in agreeableness, if that's a word. Now, not only are you going to be wrong a lot, but the market is often a really bad teacher. I know I beat the dead horse on that, but it really is. And let's say you get stopped out five times in a row, and you watch the market take off five times in a row without you being on. Then that sixth time, you're like, okay, I got this. I'm not going to let that stop take me out. I'm going to pull my stop out the market. And what happens? The market does not reverse this time. And the problem with the market being a bad teacher is that it could be a bad teacher for a long, long time. And I see people trade systems, and and, and that's something I've discovered in the psychology, and I guess it does take a rocket scientist to figure it out. But in, through my psychology research, it's very easy to recognize other people's problems. I mean, think about some people in your life, some friends and loved ones. Isn't it pretty damn easy to see what they're doing wrong in their life, okay? But it's a lot harder to see what you're doing wrong in your own life, right? And that's a whole nother conversation. But the thing is, a lot of people, and I hate to use the word delusional, but I see people trade things with a lot, a lot of risk, where they might be risking 10 to make one. And they're like, well, it works, didn't it? It's been working for years. It's like, well, okay. Well, it's been working for a year. <laughs> One thing I often tell people is like, you know, you got to be careful with that. And it's like, no, 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 it works. It's fine. It's like, okay, well, email me in three years and let me know how you're doing. And, and 
I've been at this 20 something years, at least publicly I have. I started my LLC in 95 and I think I started commentary in 97 maybe on the internet. And I have a lot of these people show me these systems early on. It's like, well, in, in that brief history of time, nobody's ever gotten back to me. So you have to really play devil's advocate as I preach when you have a so-called anthill type of strategy. And it makes you feel good. And I forget, um, is it William Eckhart? I got some quotes from him, but it's like, what feels good is not necessarily the thing you should be doing. And it's actually kind of just the opposite. It's hard to follow that trend. It's hard to stay in that bouncing Bronco, but that's where the money is. Now, the other thing I would tell myself is that you're going to need a little money management. And I have kind of a metaphorical story, I guess, here. The first time I went around the track with uh, my friend Peter Mothy, I thought getting around the track fast was the car with the, with the strongest engine, the biggest engine or whatever. And, and they had some cars out there that had a hell of a lot more horsepower than we did. But what I found fascinating was we were keeping up with them in some cases. And, and even more fascinating, we actually were able to, to pass some. Now, on the day we were on the track, we were on a very small curvy part of the track that was cut off from the rest of the track. I guess they were working on the rest of the track. So the track was pretty much nothing but curves. And we did exceptionally well on that little part of the track. But what amazed me was it wasn't so much the acceleration, but it was a deceleration. And then Peter would come up on these curves and he would be going into a gear literally 10 feet. He'd be going into the next gear, continuing to accelerate before he hit the brakes to make the turn. And that's something I didn't understand. It's like, wow, this is crazy. But he had that much confidence in his brakes that he would be able to stop to make the turn. So it's kind of like money management. It's kind of like the brakes. You have to be willing to, to get out of the market. You have to have some sort of protection. So in the hot rod community, in the racing community, if you're going to have the woe, I'm sorry, if you're going to have the go, you have to have the woe. So I thought that was kind of fascinating that the brakes are just as important as the engine. And if you're hanging around these guys, they're actually, they'll actually talk about brakes. You know, you think they'd all be talking about engines and stuff. I'm a bit of a gearhead myself, but they actually talk about brakes and they actually spend a hell of a lot of money on their brakes. And they know how important it is to be able to stop. Now, the one thing I would also say is everybody's a setup junkie or you look for these, all these different methodologies and the Holy Grail and all these different things. But what's more important or as important is that you approach trading holistically. And there's mine, there's money management, and there's your methodology. And these are intertwined, pun intended, I guess. And one can't exist without the other. And it's not enough time to get into it today, but it's something I got into heavily in trading full circle is the money management, for instance, can be both psychological and statistical. People say, Dave, is your money management psychological and statistical? My answer is yes, because shorter term, you're fulfilling those short term needs, but you're also fulfilling the longer term needs, the climbing up that Maslow's ladder, that self-actualization, that fulfillment thing that we all crave through capturing longer term trends. And as you are able to stay with positions longer term, you're going to feel better about yourself. You're going to feel better about your methodology. As you feel better about your methodology, you're going to recognize what a winner is and what a loser is. And you're going to actually feel good about kicking losers out of your portfolio. I used to get, I still drop an F-bomb. I'm not perfect. No one is, right? When I get stopped out. But once I'm stopped out, I'm like, you know what? I, I no longer have to worry about that stock. I'm so glad I got stopped out. Now I don't have to worry about it. Not glad I got stopped out, but you know what I'm saying? It's like, okay, I'm glad that's over, okay? Now I can focus on finding the next winning trade. So it becomes a process where you get better at one, you get better at all. And again, not enough time to get into a lot of details on that. So in summary along these lines is, Keep it simple. Don't overthink it. 
sprinkle in a little money management, and above all, just remember that your attitude is going to be far more important than your aptitude. Okay. What is your solution to all these problems, pitfalls, that said? Um, I would say find one simple pattern, such as persistent pullbacks. And if you want to email me, I'll help you find that on my website. And I would only trade persistent pullbacks, maybe persistent pullbacks with trend knockouts. Okay. I would trade that one pattern and I would use a liberal entry and a liberal stop, depending on the setup. It might change a little bit, but especially a liberal stop and a fairly liberal entry. And that's going to keep you from getting triggered on noise alone and a fairly liberal stop. And that's going to keep you from getting knocked out easily should the trend ensue and then following that plan. So you're going to have to plan ahead of time. And I know it's cliche, but you need to plan your trade and then trade the plan. And I'm working really hard on this psychology course. And one thing that I'm going to really emphasize is that you write down what your plan of action is going to be. If you write down something, you're, I forget the numbers, but you're 10 times more likely to remember it. And you're a hell of a lot more likely to do it. I'm reading a book now. I can't think of the name of it because I bought it last night, but, uh, uh, it might be Thinker Toys, kind of like a play on the Tinker Toys thing. You know, it's like if you act like a monk, you will become a monk, you know. So if you if you act in a certain way, you will get that discipline. Even if you don't have the discipline, you can sort of force yourself to do it. Another secret, so to speak, which this is going to be really tough, involves someone else in your trading. OK, I have a. Uh, He's doing really well now, but I often kind of pick on him because he's he's giving me more psychological material to work with than anyone combined. But he tends to trade a small account, do really well, and then it kind of goes to his head. He gets a little careless, and he and that account grows and grows and grows. And then in getting careless and over leveraging or whatever the case may be, he tends to to blow it up. And on the way back down, he just starts taking mediocre setups and everything that that helped him to grow his account he does just the opposite and then the account blows up and at one point i said look you know what you're doing you're pretty good at this you pick some good stocks and you know the system and you get it but you occasionally have these hiccups along the way would you be willing to get your get your wife involved in the process say baby this is the trade we're going to take. This is why we're going to take it. This is why I like it. This is where I'm going to get in. This is where I'm going to place my stop. This is where I'm going to take my initial profits. And this is how I'm going to trail my stop higher. And this is what I'm going to do. Tell her that. Take the trade. And then show her that you did exactly what you did. And he says, oh, no, that would end the marriage. So he knew that he's doing the wrong thing. And that's another speech I often give is that you know what you're doing wrong, provided that you've been at it for a while. If you're still searching, then the pressure's off. Take it easier on yourself. Give yourself some time. Give yourself the gift of time like I wrote about uh, in I think my last column, or it's, or it's a column that I'm uh, freshened up a little bit. Give yourself plenty of time. And that's one of the secrets of trading, if there is a secret, is to give yourself time to be able to find something that makes sense to you and then to follow the methodology. But once you get to that point, involve somebody else, or if you're ultra disciplined, then hold yourself accountable to yourself. Futures contracts of Bitcoin coming soon could be way to trade it. Yeah, we talked about that a few weeks ago. And the beauty of the futures contract, unfortunately, they, there's, a, there's a bunch of problems with that um, that we can't get into right away, right now. But there's, um, there's the decay, there's leverage, there's all kinds of crazy things that you have to deal with. But the beauty of that is that the exchange is regulated. So your money is less likely to disappear in an exchange trading a future contract than it is trading on a 
so-called Bitcoin exchange. Any, is there any tax issue if everybody used Bitcoin, how can government survive without tax? Well, last, last week we talked about that. We had a CPA in here and basically he says tax like a collectible. So I, I don't know much about taxes. I pay a lot of guy. I pay a guy a lot of money. I bet he didn't know anything about Bitcoin yet either. He's going to find out <laughs> early next year. He's going to have to sort through these trades. But, yeah, definitely pay your tax, okay? You got to pay your tax. And then I forget the um, – there's even one out there. What's it called? Monero or something? That's, that's trying to be a lot more aloof than the Bitcoin. So – yeah, you know, the bottom line is that they are taxable investments and you have to pay your tax, okay? Howard says, never, ever involved a wife in trading. Dinner, yes. Trading, never, ever. Wife, ha happy wife, happy life, not worth it. Well, if, if you are disciplined and doing the right thing, then there's no need to involve your wife. But... If you're taking mediocre setups and not honoring your stop and over leveraging and a host of other bad behaviors that I've talked about throughout today and ad nauseum for that matter, then if you want to get better, and that's if you want to get better, and that's a whole other subject too. Do you really want to get better <laughs> at this? You know, it's kind of like the uh, what's the old bear hunting joke? You know, the guy keeps going in the woods and the bear keeps tapping him on the shoulder and having his way with him. And after the third or fourth time, you know, the bear is like, you're not out here for the hunting, are you? <laughs> you know, so if you want to get better and you've exhausted all possibilities, then by all means, involve your spouse. Now, uh, I forget the original study. It's uh, something in Lewinsky or something, but I think it's uh, I first read it in Montier's book. And it's on my website if you if you. Google and search, you can find it to get proper credit. Um, but the, 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 the husbands who got their wives involved, their trading got a lot better because I think that tampered down their ego a little bit and they were less likely to be gunslingers. But unfortunately for you ladies, and, and by the way, you know, you guys aren't going to want to hear this. But I can only think of a few cases that where it didn't really, really, really badly for the ladies that that I uh, associate with through my business. Most of you women are, as a general statement, much better traders than the men. And this study actually proved it. The the wives who got their husbands involved, the trading actually got worse. So just keep that. In the, you ladies don't don't involve your husbands. Maybe involve someone else in your trading. Can you talk a moment about position sizing? Do you add on pullbacks at the initial entry? How do you pyramid? Do you do it all? No, I don't pyramid. I actually scale out of positions. And uh, that's a little it's a little beyond today's presentation. But uh, I have a spreadsheet I can give you that calculates the number of shares. So 2% per trade based on your account size. And that's if stopped out. So you would, let's say it's $2,000. Uh, let's say it's 2% or $100,000. That'd be $2,000. If using a five-point stop, 2,000 divided by five would be 400 shares. You would flip out 200 at a swing trade and then try your stop higher on the, on the rest of it. But there's a lot of, um, I have a lot of information. If you dig around my website, you get a lot. Of course, trading full circle, I'll walk you through it uh, too. All right, lots of good stuff coming in. Yeah, it's a real simple guy. I mean, it's basically I just gave you the math on that. The setting of the initial stop, and I talked a lot about that on the website also in the trading full circle, same thing. You got to ask yourself two questions. What's the volatility of the underlying instrument and how far away from that instrument you have to place your stop in order to survive that shorter term underlying volatility and then the other thing is where would you be wrong on the position and uh, if you dig around go into videos and you get a lot of information there and then if you want it all in one place obviously trading full circle 
and I'll give you a, um, I'll give you a massive discount if you want trading full circle. Just, just email me on that. I'll give it to you the half off. All right. I often mention the Phoenix strategy. And basically what I'm doing is I'm trading a pullback or a bow tie or a TKO, whatever the case may be. Usually a transitional setup, but sometimes in like a case like this, some setups that are a little bit more longer term, such as a pullback. And what I'm looking for with this is a stock that makes a long, long base. Now, before it makes the base, it falls from grace. So my theory is, and it's kind of interesting, I found some stocks like this. And then a few years back, I, I met a, a nice gentleman named Dick Fruth. We're good friends and uh, just had dinner with him a few months back. A great guy, a few weeks back. And he's running a few hundred million dollars. He's in Houston, Texas. And a big part of his strategy is this uh, Phoenix type of strategy. And he calls them tombstones. And he's got a book, Parabolic Trends and Stocks. Let me see if I have it here. The name, the name of his book is Discovering Growth Stocks and Anticipating Parabolic Moves. And a lot of what he does is it's very similar to this Phoenix type of stuff. Uh, his name is Dick Fruth. Uh, uh, Richard J. Fruth would be the author if you had to Google it. Now, with the Phoenix strategy, we're looking for supply to be distributed. Well, how do you know it's being distributed? Well, the market trades sideways sometimes for years. And what's happening during that process is some people give up. Now, if you think about it, anybody who bought the stock higher than what it is now or where it is in the base is going to look to get out of break even, but eventually they might get worn down off over a couple of years. People might need money to pay taxes or junior's college. They might get divorced. People might die, unfortunately, and it could be their kids settling their estates. In some cases, you could have a macroeconomic change. So if you look at all Service stocks, a lot of times they'll go down and just bottom out for months and then begin to take off again. Or, quite frankly, a company gets its act together. They come public with some promise of the future, like we talked about in the IPO course. That's the actual name of the course, the promise of the future. And that promise doesn't necessarily materialize right away, but sometimes they'll go down and base for a while, and then that reality becomes a reality. So the company could get its act together restructure, change the way they do business, or what they're making might necessarily have uh, might have a, a new use. What was that stupid stock they called it? Glowworm was, uh, I forget the actual stock, but it was stupid. It was Glow maybe, G-L-O-W, I forget what it was. But it was some old stodgy company that made glass, and all of a sudden the optical fiber market took off, and this company was worth a lot or at least perceived to be worth a lot so either the company gets its act together or something changes and then the stock begins to rise from its ashes now we talked about crc last week as a discretionary trade by that i mean a, a trade where you would use discretion where it got stopped out by a few pennies but and then turn right back around and went straight back up. Now, I'm not saying throw caution to the wind, but when that does happen, apply a little discretion and be willing to stick with the position because your smaller incremental loss, let's say that, let's say you give it an extra 25 cents while it's doing this little thing around the stop, that smaller incremental loss is inconsequential compared to the potential for the stock to return to its old highs. So, in a case like this, getting back to what we talked about last week, keep the bigger picture in mind when you're exercising discretion. All right, a couple of random thoughts. Seems like there's a lot of imminent top fear mongering. And there are a few things I'm worried about. We'll take a look at those in just a minute. And as I've been saying, I said over the summer, it looked like the market was topping out. Winter is coming. Even that bastard John Snow said that. 
quite often actually, but not just yet. Okay, so far, so good. And we'll take a look at some of these issues. But in the meantime, just keep following along. Be a trend following moron. All right, let's hop into the charts. If you guys want to ask about individual stocks, feel free to start doing so now. And let me pull up a couple of little things I want to show you. Let's take a look at the overall market first. I'll just take a few minutes on this. S&P 500, so far rallying nicely as of today at least, out of this little pullback in here. So, so far so good. You back chart out a little bit. This stock has had, or the market I should say, has had a pretty good run. And so far it's just corrected along the way and then taken off again. Let's, let's just in case Phil's still here, let's throw a 50-day moving average on the chart. It doesn't look like a 50. Where is the pop-up window? Here it is. Talk amongst yourselves. Yeah, and as you can see, you've got nice daylight. Looks like I drew it in last week. Daylight here, daylight here, and then a nice little daylight run here. Didn't quite get to that 50, but so far so good. That looks pretty darn good. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. NASDAQ also looks pretty good. Now, as I preach, when a market is at or even near all-time highs, air on the side of a longer-term trend. Now, I just said imminent top fear-mongering. Well, I wanted to go on record as saying that these people are fear-mongering. Well, they've been fear-mongering since last October, okay? Going into the election, of course, claiming it's the mother of all tops. And then was the market done since? Well, it's pretty much gone up. Predict early and often, I suppose. But you can see the NASDAQ closes here. be closing on a new high. So far, so good there. Let's take a look at the Rusty. Now, the Rusty had been looking pretty good. And just recently, it came down a little bit further than I would like. It came almost to the top of its base. And I was a little concerned it was down around 144. Because if it dropped below 144, it'd be back into this ridiculously long, crazy base we had for a long time. But so far, so good. And if you look at like a weekly chart, it looks a little bit better. It just looks like a normal little correction after a little bit of a breakout. So, so far, so good. Air on the side of longer term trend there. Now, what has been concerning me is some areas like chemicals recently, you can see they lost a little steam, a little bounce today. So far, so good today. Energy's got whacked fairly hard in here, so they're losing some steam. You put the bow ties in. 10-day simple, 20-day exponential, 30-day exponential, available in pretty much every charting package. You can see they turned down in here. Metals and mining got whacked recently, and it's probing these new multi-month lows. The banks have lost quite a bit of steam as of late. little bounce today and little bounce yesterday, but they're looking a little dubious in here. And notice that they're right on the cusp of bow tying down. I'll have to measure that on today's close and see where they are and of course drugs we talked about bow tied down not that long ago still look a little questionable at best and there's a few other areas like manufacturing has lost some steam and telecom has looked abysmal for a while as you can see big blue arrow pointing down there so there are some problems internally with the market but for the most part it's hanging in there, and most areas, like semiconductors, still look okay. So what we have to pay attention to is we have to pay attention to see if more weak sectors join in a fray or if these sectors, such as banks, et cetera, begin to come back and go on to make new highs. If they do, then we may have dodged a bullet. There's always something to worry about. But don't rush out in a henny-penny fashion and call a top just because you see a few things to worry about in the market. And don't get caught up in these gurus. They're calling, th they're calling for a 30-year top. And they're going to be right one day, but you can lose a lot of money shorting a market between now and then. So be damn careful. All right. Um, that's all I really have to say about the market at this point. So if you guys want to uh, keep those stock picks coming, we'll start. we'll cover as many as we can. CC for Don. Okay, that looks like a pretty good short. Um, I'm not short in this market, but 
if you wanted to fire off a short, that looks like a pretty good short. You got a bow tie down, a little bit of a pop today. You could short it below 50. And if you could stomach it, put a stop in above the high. But again, I'm not going to fight the trend. Looking to sell you Bitcoins. <laughs> Maybe. I'll take them. Why? The trend is up. That was Howard saying, the phone ringing, is somebody trying to sell me Bitcoins. I'll take them. Yes, it's going to end badly, but so what? You make a lot of money before things end badly. Uh, WRD looks interesting. Um, you know, my only concern is you've got one big up day, and that's it in the breakout. But it is a relatively new issue. I think you could certainly do a lot worse. It is a little bit of an electrocardiogram, as you can see, kind of up and down and up and down, Jackie Mason stock. But it's not bad. I hear you. It broke out, pulled back a little bit. I wouldn't, I would, would not personally trade it just because you got one bar of breakout. But the fact that it's an IPO, eh, I'm, I might, I might change my tune on that a little bit. Um, as far as trading the IPO, I'd like to see it take out the first day of trading high before getting too excited about it. And then that little five-day pattern I have, you could probably use that on that one. I think it is rate of change of acceleration of price. What's that, Phil? That was something you mentioned earlier. Rate of change of acceleration of price. Oh, you said PPPPP. LOL. <laughs> I don't remember. I don't remember what I said. SWKX. SWKS. Okay, my problem here is, looking at the long-term chart, is it's just barely getting to new highs, and then it's already pulled back into its prior little base, okay? Now, earlier we were talking, so this is a semiconductor, right? Let's take a look at the semiconductors. That's what, this, that's what the sector overall looks like, okay? And this is what your stock looks like. So for the most part, it's mostly sideways, although it's improved recently, I'll give you that. But when the sector looks like looks like this, I could find it. You want to find stocks that are, are a lot cleaner than that and trending a lot better. Derivative of derivative. Oh, okay. <laughs> Equals V of derivative. Velocity of derivative. Okay. Okay, is AC on the TSX a bow tie setup? Is AC, I don't know what AC is. TSX, let's, let's see if we can get TSX up. Let's see, jump, TSX. I don't have that symbol. TSX, is that a exchange? I mean, not exchange, an index, AC. Oh, you talk about Toronto Exchange? I don't, I don't have Toronto Exchange on this computer. I know. I got a couple of you guys. I got like two guys from Canada bugging me to, to start following Canadian stocks, and it, it, you know, unfortunately, it's just not worth it. Um, I mean, I'm sure I could find some opportunities there, but as far as doing something on educational business and then having another market to look at. It's just it's just not worth it. You know, maybe someday, maybe someday if I get a staff, we can do some of these uh, wild and crazy things. Yeah, we talked about that one. BA is Boeing. I'm not going to be a huge fan just because your HV is 14. And I like stocks that have a little bit higher HV. And then also... Notice I drew in a big blue arrow last week. There's still a big blue arrow pointing sideways in this one. So that's kind of exhibit A, what I was talking about earlier. It's lost momentum or it's going sideways. Oh, you're talking about Toronto Stock Exchange? Yeah, I don't have that symbol. Sorry about that. Carlson wants to know about VSM. Uh, as a short or a long, I, I would not... I would not trade either one, but if I had to, and the volatility is a little bit low, it actually looks like a short now. It's a first thrust down, as you can see. 
So your entry, let's say about 38, and then if you could stomach it, a stop above the top, above the high, and then uh, it's also a bow tie or soon to be bow tie. But I wouldn't rush out and short just yet. And as I've said, at nauseam in 2007, around October, if memory serves, the market was making marginal new highs, all-time highs, that is. And I couldn't find a long side set up to save my life. I actually found a few shorts and started apologizing to my clients for recommending shorts. We're not quite there just yet. I am having trouble finding a lot of setups, but I, I could still find a few long side setups in here. And I don't think it's time to go to get crazy bearish just yet. Now, if you feel like firing off a shard here and there just to stay in shape, not a bad, not a bad uh, idea. But don't go crazy bearish. I don't think I could bring um, – uh, Andre wants me to do a case study on uh, GBTC. I don't think I have that symbol yet. I could get it off of stock charts. I don't know if I could do that quickly. I can't do that on the fly. But uh, next, if I think about it, I can get stock charts up running ahead of time. HV not always relevant with persistency. Close to crease HV follows WMT. HV not always relevant. Well, HV, HV, I hear what you're saying, but this kind of makes my case. My case with historical volatility is that if you're trading these markets thinking that you're getting less volatility and you're compensating by trading more shares, then you're mistaken because a low volatility market could still make a big move. Now, as a general statement, yes, you want to be trading higher volatility stocks. But, yeah, a, a low volatility stock could also make a move. Now, one aberration that I think you're alluding to is if you have persistency of trend, meaning that the stock goes up day after day after day, your HV will drop off. So that's a bit of an aberration when it comes to historical volatility. But as a general statement, I want to be in stocks with somewhat higher of an HV. I think probably the lowest I'll trade now is in the 30s. But no, I hear you. Good observation. I can't argue with you on that one. You could use ACDVF, which is a US ACDVF. Nope, don't have that one either, guys. Sorry about that. Air Canada. Air Canada. Let's see. Air Canada. C A N A D A. Nope. I'm sorry. I don't have that. I mean, one day I'm going to be forced to, to upgrade that chart service to the uh, to the newer one. You know, with software, you have to pry from my old. I'm becoming an old fart. You got to pry from your my old dead hands. Uh, this one looks interesting. I'd actually like to see it break out the new highs and then pull back again. But yeah, maybe on a pullback we'd have to reevaluate this one. Certainly in a in a accelerated uptrend. Now look at the HV here. Actually getting a little crazy at 105. But, yeah, I want to pull back possibly maybe a TKO, a TKO type of move. I like a TKO move in something like this, especially accelerated higher, because it'll knock out a lot of players because the Johnny come lately is a piling on right now. And then if it does go back up, that'd be fantastic. Roku's gotten a little too crazy. Um, it's just all over the place now. I mean, it, it, it just was too crazy to go after. Even back here when I said the buy at B would be at this level here, that's just too crazy. I, I, I can't buy into a gap that big. A What's what's um, what's a 10-point gap on a $20? It's, it's even less than that. It's like, let's say, that's like a 50% gap overnight. Yeah, 50%, 60% gap overnight, even though it's technically a setup. It's technically, I guess, the, the five-day breakout system thing, the Dave Light system right here on this day. But I can't just buy on that extreme. I'm sorry. You know, that's just too crazy. I'm not sorry. I'm just I can't do it. Yeah, DNRA is this the, this is the one that we were talking about earlier as being a possible Phoenix type of stock. And I sort of broke the rules on this one because it was a Phoenix stock. And this is where I liked it on this trend knockout day right here, and then I kept it on the service until it eventually triggered just because I was keeping the big picture in mind. So I kind of bent the rules a little bit on that one. If you're newer to my methodology, don't bend the rules too much. But once you um, get a feel for things, especially if it's like a Phoenix 
type of strategy, then by all means. Cato. Okay, uh, let's see. Well, you could call this a phoenix, but usually what I like to see is a long, long, long base. So a year from now, I might get interested. But I hear you. Um, if it makes a bow tie up or something, maybe you want to pull back. We'll, we'll know when we see it. Like, uh, what's his name? Potter Stewart. But right now, you've got some overhead resistance to deal with here. And then after that, I guess it'd be a good problem. But right above that, you got quite a bit. So for now, I think I'd pass on that one. Jim wants to know about PEN, P-E-N. Okay. Um, it's not bad. Uh, you got the one wide range bar here, followed by a little follow through. It's a little on the thin side, but it's a high price stock. So I wouldn't get too excited about it being thin. It looks okay. Uh, I would prefer if it had more days and this acceleration higher. But it is, as I just said, accelerating. So I'm not going to argue with that. I can't really argue with it. Maybe a little bit more knockout move. Maybe that's what I'm kind of looking at here. That doesn't look just right. But it's not bad. You could certainly do worse than that. MU, that's going to be a big, thick stock. Don likes these thick ones. Uh, even though it's making new highs, it's doing so with less vigor, okay? It looks like it's losing a little bit of steam just by eyeballing it. So it would actually have to accelerate higher and then maybe play a pullback along the way. MTH is going to be a home builder, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, put this on your watch list, but and it's kind of thin, but it would actually have to accelerate higher. If you're long, stay long, but it, it would actually have to accelerate higher and then pull back to be a setup. Guy says, with doing energy, if from a long few months ago, you're long from a few months ago, do you do anything now that a bow tie average is turned down? Uh, no, because before you even look at the stock, we had we had a stock a while back, I think it was CNX, that bow tied down like two or three times while we were long, and it looked like a sell signal, and it was a sell signal, but it looked like you should be out of the market, but it didn't hit the stop. So your life is going to get a lot easier when you just follow your your plan. And if anything, I think do, DO looks good. Um, you've got a little overhead supply to deal with, but so far you've got a nice run from lows and you've got a bit of a pullback. It's not the best setup in the world, but if anything, long or short, I would say this is a possible buy. Just have a chair ready. Uh, have a stop if you're long from a while back, like you said, by all means. AQ bought a little. Yeah, AQ is a um, – this is the, the new high setup. So it would have to it have to close above 12 based on a uh, IPO pattern here, buy it B, to be a legitimate pattern. Uh, SQ and a pullback. Let's take a look at that. Yeah, absolutely. That looks pretty good. I was looking at this one earlier. Yeah, put it in your put it in on your momentum list. Q N S T. Q N S T. Um, I think we talked about this one last week, as you can see. It just made this one bar breakout, and then it's just chopping around in here. If you're long, stay long. But for now, I think I would leave it alone unless it broke out the new highs and then pull back again. Stop me if you heard that before. T N T R time to sell. I don't know. Where's your stop? No. Why would you sell it? It's going up. Buy things that go up, sell things that go down. But, yeah, it's hitting a little resistance. But so what? If you're long, stay long. Now, if you have an initial profit target, that's fine. End tap. Yeah, this one just kind of took off. Uh... You can't obviously, you know, didn't set because one thing I often preach about is look at stocks that take off and ask yourself, could you have caught the move or should you have caught the move? In this particular case, there's no reason why I would have caught this move. Now, every now and then it'll, it'll be glaring at you. I'll see a perfect setup. 
I want to show you the times when, no, there's nothing of mine that would have caught this move. And I want to show you, I want to say that now. So when sometimes you come to these shows and you see the fact that I'll say, hey, look at this beautiful TKL back here, you'll know that I'm not just being perfect hindsight. So even in perfect hindsight, there's no pattern of mine there. And that's fine. You know, unless you're Harvey Weinstein, as I often preach, you can't kiss all the women. And now it looks like he can't do it either. Uh, this one just has these two huge bars in this little uptrend, HV110. That's a little crazy. Um, I think I would leave this one alone for now and let it shake out. But yeah, that's even that's a little too crazy even by my standard. Oops, I just knocked out a few positions, a few of you guys. A Q U A. Um, the range on this one now, I I know I have these breakout patterns in IPOs, but there's a, quite a few caveats. And there's too many of them to get into today. But one of the caveats is if you're going to buy something like oh let's say the A Q. Notice that you got a pretty good range on here. From 9 to 13, what is that? 9 minus th uh, 13 minus 9 is what, 4? So the range on that is pretty big. It's like a 40-something percent run in this stock. So you know it has a propensity to move or it can move. Whereas this is like a, was that, a 10 percent move? Eh, in an IPO, that's not much. So rather than buy the new high, I would wait for a secondary type of setup. Jim wants to know about EC. I like this one better if this range was way down low at the old time highs, all time highs. I'm sorry, all time lows. Yeah, this looks really good though, Jim. I like it. Uh, it needs a little bit deeper pullback, but that's a pretty clean looking setup. So if it pulled back to like 11, maybe. I would be more excited about it. You want to see some people knocked out after a big thrust hire like that. But, yeah, good eye on that one, Jim. I mean, that's just short of a high five. Good job. ALNA, we talked about that one? Yeah, we just talked about that one. H-U-N. Um, let's take a look. One thing that's a little concerning here is that, it, that remember, I kept saying I like stocks to pull back deeply. Well, it's pulled all the way back to its breakout point. It's not a horrible looking setup because you, you looks like you will get a reversion to the mean back in the direction of the trend. And that's what we're looking for. But the fact that it pulled all the way back to where it broke out, I'm, I'm a little less excited about it. CRZO, no. Hey, Aaron, welcome back. CRZO. Yeah, that looks pretty good, Aaron. Uh, let's back the chart out a little bit, see what we got. Yeah, see, you don't have a real massive amount of overhead supply. You just got this constant uh, drip of selling throughout. So that looks pretty good. Now, keep in mind, in an oil field stock, I'm a little bit more lenient because they tend to be a little choppy and can be held a little hot, more hostage to the underlying commodity. But that's, that's a decent-looking setup. You could certainly do a lot worse. I mean, I'm not jumping up and down. But that's not a bad looking setup in that one. And Donald also called it. Good job, Donald. I know Donald called first, but Aaron's a client, so I have to give him credit. <laughs> AVGO. Um, it kind of broke out of this range and then it pulled back to its range, so that's a little concerning. Margin call. I guess I joke in fun anymore. <laughs> uh, so I would let it make new highs and then maybe play some pullbacks along the way. But, uh, you know, semiconductors right now are pretty hot. So you might be able to find something a little cleaner within the semis. We're almost out of time. Let's do one more. Slob, that's going to be a big, thick stock. Yeah, you know, here's, here's, here's Exhibit A, you know. Okay, we're trend followers, and the stock's banging out new lows. So this is not a stock that we want to trade. So there's your Exhibit A, especially when it comes to net-net. You know, let's go back to August, 
I appreciate you bringing that up. <laughs> and you can see that it's actually gone down for three months since August. So, um, no, in my best Nicholas Fine voice. Okay, I'm gonna have to go ahead and shut things down because we're we're out of time. But I have a blast doing these, as you can tell. So thank you guys for showing up. I appreciate you being here. And you know, any unanswered questions, daviddavelander.com. If it's a question that requires thought, I'll make it fodder for uh, a upcoming show. I think next week is, is uh, Thanksgiving, so no show next week. And then after that, I don't know what my schedule is. There's some things that are going on in my personal life and business where I might have to back off a shows for a little while. So hopefully I'll see all you guys in about two weeks. But if not, I might need to take a little break for a while from the shows. But I do love doing these shows, so I appreciate you guys coming. Thank you so much. Everyone have a fantastic weekend and Thanksgiving if we don't talk between now and then. Thank you so much.